EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the Mastercard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning in ICT and is part of the Foundation's Young Africa Works programming. Hello, I'm Joy Doreen Bira. Glad to have you join us on EdTech Monday Africa. On this edition, our focus is on EdTech as an enabler of education for learners living with disabilities. The exclusion of persons with disabilities from education has been shown to have negative long-term economic consequences in the form of lost or diminished income. Nevertheless, EdTech is providing or is proving to be an enabler of access to education for all, including learners with disabilities. The adoption of EdTech in Africa has been growing and reports indicate that the e-learning market in Africa is expected to grow at a compound annual rate of 11.2% between this year and the year 2027. Though there has been a proliferation of EdTech in Africa, innovations in EdTech geared towards learners with disabilities are still woefully limited despite the ability EdTech has to provide a framework for inclusive education for persons living with disabilities. And this is why we're asking, why is it important for persons with disabilities to have access to quality education? And how can EdTech facilitate such access? You can share your feedback with us on EdTech Monday at mastercardfdn.org. As always, we have knowledgeable panelists on this special edition. And first, Maria Baron Rodriguez, Educational Technology Specialist at the World Bank. Maria has more than eight years of experience working in the design, implementation, and evaluation of education policies at the national and international levels. Rebecca Moniki, Information Technology Manager at Next Step Foundation, a role that involves the installing and configuring of computer hardware operating systems and applications monitoring and maintaining computer systems and networks, resolving, diagnosing and solving network problems and relevant software issues. And we also have Ronel Klink, who is the Account Executive for Basic Education at Microsoft. She works with a range of partners, ministries of education, and provincial departments of education, leading private school groups, e-learning curriculum teams, subject advisors, and educators. And well, to our panelists, it's so good to have you here. And we're honored to be having this conversation uh, with you. And to start us off, what is the status of learners with disabilities in Africa? What kind of education facilities are available for them? Maria, would you like to start? Let's start by discussing what is the role on EdTech for students with disabilities? What are the potential benefits that it may have for them? I think that educational technology can be a catalytic tool in advancing equity and inclusion in education and ensuring that all learners, including learners with disabilities, can access, participate, and achieve in learning. Um, indeed, various studies have pointed to the potential positive impacts of equipping classrooms and schools with access accessible ICT and providing learners with disabilities with assistive technologies. Some of these benefits include uh, to improve the access uh, and learning outcomes, as well as broader educational, psychological, and social impacts. And this correlate a lot to actually when teachers and students are trained and supported in using these devices. Um, now, let me quickly go back a bit uh, to your point on data. Uh, there is a big problem with data. We need more data uh, regarding students with disabilities in Africa, and actually most of the world. Uh, we need more data in access, we need more data to know and monitor attendance, and we need more data to know if they're completing and not dropping out of primary, secondary, and even higher level education and TVET. This is a very, very important part. And the World Bank, which is the institution I work in, and I'm part of the education and technology team, has committed to ensure that projects are inclusive and also that they can incorporate uh, this priority of including data as part of one of the priorities. We need to know what is happening at the classroom level. The data we have is actually most of it, you mentioned it, and it's something that shouldn't be happening. We should have more detailed data, more granular data, especially during the pandemic and also post-pandemic. 
we know that the pandemic has affected uh, educational outcomes among all learners. We also know that marginalized students, including students with disabilities, have suffered most. So it is very important to encourage, to keep encouraging governments and countries to establishing uh, data collection mechanisms and also education management and information systems that can be put in place so that we so that we actually have data for decision making and we're not flying blind because we need to know the, the how many students have disabilities we need to know then informed decisions on assisted technology and education and technology devices that are needed based on that data this is very important for teachers for students and also for families uh, mm -hmm. but with that let me give a, a bit of the word to ronel and, and becky which i'm sure they will have much more to share. Thank you. All right. Becky, um, from your perspective, what kind of education facilities are available to uh, learners living with disabilities? I think uh, so far uh, we are improving uh, in terms of facilities. What, uh, what we offer to learners with disabilities uh, nowadays, it's more improved. We have improved a lot, which is good, mm -hmm. but we still have a way to go. Uh, what I mean is, if we look on previous years back, then um, there were no schools for persons with disability, but at least now the schools are there, though they mm -hmm. are not yet enough. We still lack uh, facilities like lifts, labs, maybe mobility devices like wheelchairs and crutches, uh, braille for the blind, um, sign language interpreters. Yeah, and a lot more we are missing when it comes Great. to education. Yeah. And I'm coming to, uh, I'm coming more to uh, find out what the journey was like for you, given the examples you just mentioned. Uh, but Ronel, I want to hear your perspective as well, looking at what Becky just mentioned in regard to some of the uh, facilities that are not in these classrooms for learners living with disability. What's your perspective on the status so far? Um, well, you know, absolutely. You know, the, the narrative in South Africa is very similar to what Maria and Becky were saying. Uh, we know worldwide, um, you know, learners, one in four learners have a disability. Some of them may be severe, um, like a physical challenge, uh, being blind, um, deaf, hard of hearing, etc. Um, but I, I also want to complement what Maria was saying around the lack of data, because if we do not know how many learners we, we have who have a disability, uh, in a particular range or country, et cetera, how do we then facilitate the process around finding adequate teachers? So how do we know how many teachers we need? Because the ratio for, uh, the, uh, for disabilities is very different um, in the education sector uh, with learners who are differently abled as well. So, you know, if we have sufficient data, we will then prepare adequately and have sufficient teachers um, as well. Thanks, Joy. Great. Okay, um, Becky, let me come back to you. You know, you mentioned quite some interesting uh, facilities there. You talked about uh, wheelchairs, you talked about Braille for uh, learners, you know, uh, learning with uh, the visual impairment disability or the blind. And I want to find out from you specifically, what was your journey like going through an education system that doesn't fully uh, recognize that they are learners living and learning with a disability in the various schools that we have uh, around the country for you. What was that like? Okay, for me, uh, my journey is very long, but I'm trying to be brief. First, I had to join a boarding school at a very young age. I was six then. Um, this six. is because, yeah, I was six years when I joined a boarding school. Uh, uh, this is because I couldn't walk to the school. Uh, the school was very far from home and I couldn't walk for long due to my, my disability. So it was challenging for my parents to take me to school and pick me on daily basis. 
uh, it might not look challenging to the modern parent because that has become like a routine nowadays, especially in urban areas. But back then in rural areas, things were different because even means of transport was a problem. Uh, probably <laughs> the main means of transport was a bicycle. That's what my, my dad used to take me to school with. And it was very far. Uh, then after primary school, I had to join uh, secondary school. I went to join town for the physical handicap. At least like there was a bit easier because the prison is accessible. There were ramps all over. There were teachers and students who understood what disability is. And also some of them have different disabilities as well. Um, and though there were various challenges here and there, like finances and transport, when maybe um, opening and traveling back home when schools are closed, but that didn't affect me much since I was able, I was exposed and I was able to see uh, uh, being joining uh, and it is an internal uh, national national school. Uh, I met so many people with different disabilities, and I was witnessing uh, uh, other students struggle more than me. And that is even when I accepted myself. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, to cut it brief. Uh, Coming to campus, that's where I struggled a lot. When I joined uh, where the, the university I went, there were no lifts, no ramps. Stairs were all over. Uh, the floor was slippery. When it comes into hostels, they were applied because it was from a distance and the path where I used to pass by was so rough and flooded when it rains. So whenever it rains, I used to use a very wrong way, being rained on so that I can attend classes on time. Uh, the bathroom and toilets were even worse. Getting to classes was challenging sometimes because of the lectures, rooms were upstairs. Even the exam rooms, you could find that you have an, an exam at fourth floor changed at the last minute and you must show up on time otherwise okay. you, will, yeah. <laughs> you will find your classmates through with their papers and there is no additional time everything was normal like others uh, uh there, there, you, there is no any special treatment you have to do the same exam they are doing and use the same time they are using despite what you have, the challenges you've gone through. There were no friendly tears, uh, no, and nothing was, was different from it. And looking at that kind of exclusion that, that you had to experience, what are some of those learnings that um, you've heard over time and what would you recommend to all the people viewing the show and looking to have inclusivity or increasing <coughs> inclusivity in institutions of learning to include uh, those learners living with a disability. And also, if you may, specify your disability so our viewers can contextualize what that is like. Okay, Joy. Uh, I, my disability is physical. It's physical disability. <coughs> I have a risk shoes one of my legs is short than the other uh, so okay what i can recommend is accommodation for everyone in all learning institutions uh, there should be no limit for persons with disabilities to join any school they want because they are not not accessible so you find that you are forced to join any school which will accommodate you with your disability even if it's not your dream school. These are prime to me in high school, but in campus, there were, 
There was a difference since I was the only person with, with disability allowed. You see, if mm -hmm. it was a campus where it is specialized for the persons with disability, maybe they could have looked to those things. Uh, it could be accessible for me. But since it was just a, a normal uh, school, there were no accessibility, which is not fair. Uh, I think accommodation should be uh, all inclusive. Yes, yes, everywhere. Um, there, there should also add more time for persons with disability when it comes to exam. Imagine the class is changed and you have to join your classmates and it's upstairs. By the time mm -hmm. you're there, they are already started and doing the exam, yet you have to start and you have to take same time when the exam uh, right. When the examiners say stop, you are not excluded. You have to stop as well. Also, I, I like that where yeah. the conversation on education technology comes into play. Um, for example, having uh, exams for learners uh, living with a disability being on soft copy, so they're not um, interrupted by, in the event that the timing is the same, then they can do their exams online as opposed to those uh, without a physical <laughs> disability. And uh, which brings me to Ronell, because, uh, you know, Microsoft is, is, a, is a big organization. And I'm, I'm curious to know, given the challenges that uh, Becky has mentioned, what are some of the ed tech innovations that have been successfully implemented in Africa to make it all inclusive um, for learners with disabilities? Thank you so much, Joy. And, you know, Becky, um, really what you've mentioned in terms of your disabilities and not having access to um, certain ed tech, which would have ma made your life so much easier. So Microsoft thinks of, you know, um, learners with different, who are differently abled with the different ranges. So we know that learners specifically who have, for example, who are visually impaired, they, their strength would be hearing enabled, right? So because they're unable to see, um, you know, they, they'll be able to hear a lot better than the normal person would be as well. So Microsoft has different technologies. Um, there's technologies such as what we call the immersive reader. So the immersive reader is an example, uh, Becky, I'm, I'm relating to what you were saying with having more time as well. So um, immersive reader would read your text out aloud as an example to you, um, if that's your impairment. Um, or it could also then um, highlight certain things like speech to text as well. Um, for example, instead of writing, like we were saying, Becky, you don't have enough or sufficient time for your assessments or your exams. Um, speech to text, um, that's a different technology as well, built into Immersive Reader, where you can then read um, text out aloud instead of handwriting. So all of those are ways in which you can then make uh, learning more inclusive. Um, it speaks to your strengths and so forth as well. Um, I think of, you know, young learners as well, uh, where they're learning to read and so forth as well. We've got a picture dictionary built into immersive reader as well. The picture diction, uh, dictionary allows you then to associate um, words with pictures and so forth as well. Um, if you're learning a new language, etc., it also translates. Um, recently, we've also added Isi Zulu, one of our vernacular languages in South Africa, um, to the translation tool as well. So all of those things are to empower the learner to achieve more. Um, you know, providing those tools that are necessary to make sure that the learner is able to achieve at their best level. And at what scale would you say they are at? If you were to gauge the percentage, what would you place it at? And what more needs to be done to increase the scale of these innovations to be more inclusive for learners with disabilities? Yeah, so we don't have exact data, you know, again, to Maria's point, there's not specific data around 
um, the amount of learners with disabilities or how much we've reached, et cetera. But what I can tell you is Microsoft has a, a Microsoft agreement where provincial departments in South Africa purchase that agreement and that gives learners free access to tools like the immersive reader and so forth uh, to empower to, uh, them to achieve more. So there's no specific data points uh, per se, um, but that is uh, um, the type of tool that is available both to the learners and to the educators. And I keep coming back to that joy because what we find is in every instance where you're teaching learners who are differently able to have different disabilities, it's important to empower the educator as well. And I just want to provide a, a beautiful um, analogy. And it's not an analogy, it's actually a true story. So um, one of our partners, uh, Roger, Dr. Layton, um, ran a program um, that was funded by uh, Microsoft as well, for visually impaired educators. Um, and there was a range of, of, of different activities that he took them through, but it's also about how to use technology to effectively drive and improve learning outcomes. Um, and why I want to mention this specifically, at the beginning of this project, um, you know, one of the teachers was visually impaired. And she was told by the principal that you actually, you can't teach um, in a normal environment, learners who don't have a disability, et cetera. And what was so interesting, she actually went about it teaching and she was teaching a second um, language in South Africa called Afrikaans. Um, and she oh. actually identified one of the learners who were differently able. She's blind, remember this. So the previous teacher didn't pick up that this child had, um, he was actually hard of hearing. And she was blind, but yet she still picked up, she still managed to pick up that this learner had a disability as well. So for us mm -hmm. um, at Microsoft, we tend to focus more on the educator. How do we empower them? What are the upskilling that is required for the educator to impart that knowledge and skill to, to the learner as well? All right. Um, that's interesting and also contextualizes uh, some of the recommendations that uh, Becky talked about. And uh, Maria, if, if I might come to you from, from where you sit, what policies are in place to ensure that tech innovations support um, equitable, you know, all-inclusive education and uh, solutions uh, to include those living with disabilities? When we think about uh, designing uh, an intervention for learners with disabilities, we need to think about people, we need to think about products, about the pedagogy, pedagogical approach, about the policies, about the place, and about the provision. So those are the six mm -hmm. P's. And let me describe them very briefly. Um, and, and I would invite the audience to read the publication later because it's it gives examples across Africa and also in other regions. Uh, right. So with people, we need to engage the ecosystem in terms of not only teachers, but also parents. During the pandemic, for example, we have seen that parents were key because the students were not at the classroom. Actually, in some countries, parents received some training to support their kids, uh, to actually have some type of access to remote learning during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. So. Then when we think about products, a barrier that we have heard a lot is that most edtech devices, especially the ones that are deemed as high tech, are very expensive for families and school. And this limits their affordability and accessibility. In addition, in addition there, is, there, is a, there needs to be a bit more investigation on, in terms of there is low demand, high prices, in some cases, some other solutions could be explored, engaging an ecosystem of perhaps the private sector and another, another organizations as well. Then in terms of pedagogical approaches, it's important to monitor the process of, 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 of children with disabilities and students with disabilities and provide adaptations. So just providing the assistive technology device is not enough. A good teacher, mm -hmm. like Rhonda was saying, will actually um, adapt their, uh, the, the peda their pedagogies, their practices to support the student and will actually enhance the, the use of the assistive technology tool. 
either if it's low, low tech or high tech. So I think it's important to invest a lot in the training of teachers. And then we need to think about the policies. Uh, sometimes across many governments, not only in Africa, the, the policies that relate to learners with disabilities are spread out among education ministries, among health ministries. Sometimes uh, there are ministries for marginalized populations and they also cover them. And sometimes they don't talk to each other. So a whole of government approach is key. And also key policies on what is the vision that the country has to, to help learners with disabilities. And here, I think I'm very optimistic. I think we've seen recently uh, a lot of advancements, a lot of commitments being made by governments in terms of inclusive education, as well as international mm -hmm. organizations. So I speak from the World right. Bank. We have committed to make our projects more inclusive. And, and so many other organizations work on this, WHO, UNICEF, UNESCO. So I think that's an important point. Um, in terms of the place, we need to think about um, actually different type of places. Where, where educational technology can be deployed, can be at the home, can be at school level, and that requires different types of, of skills and also design. And in terms of the provision, I think that funding mechanisms for initiatives focusing on tech for inclusive education I, are often project-based and rarely combine a comprehensive attention to all the necessary components for a successful mm -hmm. implementation. So being very, detail oriented and having a very good design and an iterative design, pilot things, learn from them, and then go to scale is something that we need to take into account as well. Uh, and I'm sorry, I know I've spoken a lot and I know my, my colleagues here would like to speak more, but I think this is a, a topic that all right. we're all passionate about. Back to you, Joy. And rightfully so, um, you know, because I think this is one of the most neglected areas in the education system. But thankfully, we now have ed tech solutions. Um, I still think that these ed tech solutions are just a handful uh, to deal with the various challenges that learners living with disabilities face. And uh, which brings me to my next question, and, and hopefully Becky as well can chime in on this one. You know, uh, innovations on ed tech specific to learners with disabilities are countable. Um, and that shows you how much less attention is paid uh, when developing solutions or ed tech solutions to be all inclusive, to include learners with disabilities or delayed milestones. And I'm wondering if we were in an ideal world with all inclusive ed tech solutions, how better would the lives of those learning with a disability be? Um, and how more improved would the lives of these learners be? Becky, if I would start with you. EdTech is amazing and uh, really helps persons with disability in the need of education. Uh, I think if e-learning can be given maybe a 24 hours access to learners, it can help bring a lot of students remotely without the trouble to walk or through to class. Um, mm -hmm. can, uh, can also help by making sure that all learning software are made accessible to all. Uh, this can make learning easier. Uh, for example, talk to text for the blind, closing captions for those with hearing deficits, uh, magnifying the screen for the short sighted and global collaboration if they are provided with those assistive devices to make the education technology accessible for everyone, despite uh, the challenge. Yeah. No one is limited to uh, be in the education technology. Also skills, uh, leverage on technology, on persons with ability, on how mm -hmm. to improve skills, uh, digital literacy, data annotation, and soft skills should be done, which we do uh, to the next step. I like that. Um, and Ronel, 
from what Behi is saying, it looks like there's a lot of work for uh, ed tech innovators, ed tech developers, or techpreneurs in this case, uh, for them to develop solutions for the various uh, categories of disabilities or for people who are differently abled. And what systemic uh, changes need to take place for this to happen? What is Microsoft looking to develop um, better solutions specific to different categories of people living with disabilities that could help them advance their education as is, especially in Africa? So Microsoft is very intentional about making sure that technology is accessible. So accessibility is built into every application. Um, you know, whether you look at the Microsoft 365 um, suite of applications as well. Um, you know, for us sometimes, um, maybe your eyesight is, uh, you know, not as good as it was 10 years ago. Um, you know, it's it's enlarging text. It's, it's speaking to things like those things to improve the learning process as well. And I want to come back to something um, that, Becky was saying, making learners who are differently able, giving them the power to collaborate as well. So technologies in at Microsoft is more definitely about that. Like I said, speech to text, putting on your video if you need to sign, um, et cetera, so that someone else is, is able to understand and interpret technology and so forth as well. I think it's uh, making learning fun. And one of those technologies um, are like, for example, the Xbox machine, because we, we need to make sure that learning is interactive and so forth as well. Well, and I see Becky smiling immediately when I mentioned an Xbox because that's what Microsoft has done. Um, you know, to make sure that everyone is inclusive in the gaming environment as well, which speaks to a lot of technology that Microsoft has produced to make learning fun. And I, I want to come back to again what, how Microsoft looks at accessibility and making sure that it's, it's inclusive, inclusive, but also. Uh, equitable as well. So as much as we talk about the types of tools and applications, um, devices, etc., to empower, learn empower learners with disabilities, we also need to think about how to foster social and emotional learning as well, making sure that learners feel confident in order to achieve as well. It's one of those things that we don't necessarily, um, you know, take a look at it. And one of the things again built into the Microsoft technology is called a reflective app. Now the reflective app allows you know, educators to, to take a feel of how learners are doing in the classroom. As an example, maybe they're not confident to say, I feel this way today, but they can tell the teacher through the reflective app, today's not a good day for me. I've had so many different challenges and, and you know, let's just take it easy for, uh, for today as well. So the reflective app is a good way for, for teachers to measure the room, to find out what's happening with the classes as well. In terms of just providing inclusive design and so forth as well. I've, I've brought in the different types of applications. We've also got an app called Reading Progress. Now, Reading Progress really measures you as a personalized learner. Um, you know, we don't see learners as, as an average or compare them to another learner because you are going to achieve based on your capability as well. So reading progress is really just by the name. It allows learners to improve at their own pace. And it's a self-paced app that they can install on their mobile device, on a laptop, et cetera. Right. And so education is three dimensional, maybe four dimensional, because we have the learner, we have the teacher or the educator, we have uh, the parent and we also have, uh, you know, the implementers of education in the different countries across Africa. And Maria, you talked about uh, the six P's where you also talked about people in this case, the parents, the teacher, uh, the learner as well and everybody else in the ecosystem. But, you know, there are specific skills that we really need to enhance for us to be able to make this more inclusive for learners with disabilities. What are those, if you might briefly uh, talk about that in closing as we bring this conversation to an end? Thank you, Joy. Um, first, I want to, to give a bit of a remark in terms of the importance of, of technology to actually uh, not decrease human interaction, but actually enhance it. 
This is something that is part of mm -hmm. the World Bank education and technology approach. For us, technology should be used to reimagine human connections and enhance it. And, uh, and technology is as useful uh, as it is if it's helping a teacher or if it's helping a learner. So I think definitely put, putting those people putting people at the center is, is key. Um, also, we, we really think about the principle of asking why. So sometimes uh, if, if, for example, there is a program in, in a country that it's a starting perhaps with the decision on buying uh, a lot of tablets, those tablets need, need to have a clear purpose and a clear design on how they are going to enhance learning for the student or how maybe are going to make teachers' life easier. Uh, that is the point I'm trying to make in the sense that um, technology is only as good as it is in improving, improving uh, learning outcomes and having educational objectives in general. Um, but with that, let me go to your question. I think that in terms of what are the capacities needed to have a sustained impact on EdTech uh, to help and support the students with disabilities, I think for sure we need to think about institutional capacities and enabling conditions and enabling ecosystem because EdTech interventions don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, for example, there is a product that the World Bank has developed, it's called the EdTech Readiness Index and identifies six key critical pillars in the tech ecosystem of, of any country. One of mm -hmm. them being school management, teachers, students, devices, connectivity, and digital resources. Um, it's important to think about this. Let's say a school doesn't have good connectivity or doesn't have you know, even access to electricity then that supports our decision that maybe in the short term, we need to think about low-tech low mechanisms. And then maybe in the medium to long term, we can think about more high-tech solutions to help students. So I think thinking about this is important, thinking about institutional capacities as well. So uh, I mentioned before policies, and I think this is mm -hmm. not trivial. It's important for countries to establish clear policies and their vision on how they plan to make their systems of education more inclusive um, in the right. short to medium to long term. Or what, are, what are their targets and who is responsible for complying with those targets? I All right, Becky, I would like to hear from you. Um, and knowing that you are speaking for a good number of learners living with disability across Africa, um, an opportunity for you as well to make recommendations to ministries of education and policy implementers as well. Um, what would you like to see changed immediately? Because uh, Maria has talked about how technology is used to reimagine human interactions, but also to unlock the potential of the advantages that come with education technology. From, from, from you and to everyone else who is listening, what would you want changed immediately uh, to enable learning for learners with disabilities be made more easier? Um, I think for me, uh, what I can say is if uh, persons with disabilities are provided with what they need, if their challenges are well observed and uh, maybe solved, like the what I would need to be uh, changed is um, the accommodation and um, the inclusive, inclusion for everyone uh, because uh, there is uh, a lot of challenges which learners are going through. If we solve the challenges, uh, we are going to make to solve the problem. Uh, one of, the, of them, uh, maybe the one of saying the lack of assistive devices, uh, medical issues, uh, maybe uh, if they are observed, uh, they are, the medical issues are well observed, uh, maybe a uh, person, like for example, a person with urbanism means uh, maybe a sunscreen, which may not be easier to avoid uh, due to personal or family issues or poverty. 
are those needs if they are well observed and analyzed? Um, maybe or again, lack of inclusive schools. If the schools are made inclusive, uh, and inadequate financial support, uh, we, we look on to our accommodations, we look on uh, providing um, learners with, uh, with disabilities, with uh, devices like uh, the end pointer, maybe magnified screen for those who are visually impaired, and mm -hmm. uh, maybe we we look on to difference in academic requirements. I uh, would say in transport, um, differences in disability student services. It a lot more. If we observe, there's a lot more to observe, but if right. we made the accommodation and inclusive, uh, accessible, that will solve the problem. Right. And also, I guess, uh, less of brick and mortar and opening up the classrooms to the virtual world uh, to allow, you know, ease of access for these learners living with disability. Thank you so much, Becky, uh, for that. And Ronel, um, briefly, your final or last word on this. How do we take this forward? A message to the tech developers, techpreneurs and innovators that we have in Africa. For most people, technology makes life easier. For people with disabilities, technology makes life possible. There are so many different applications that one could be exposed to. And, you know, speaking to what you've just mentioned, Joy, around edtech solutions, I want to give a very practical example because the learning process is about making our learners active citizens, making them future ready. That's what the classroom environment should allow for. One of the applications which you can go and find on your mobile app is called Seeing AI. It was developed by a programmer at Microsoft who is blind, by the way. Um, and Seeing AI allows you then to scan a menu at a restaurant and it reads out aloud. You can imagine how that empowers people who are visually impaired or completely blind. Um, the Seeing AI app can also recognize bank notes as well. So, for example, you can scan, it can tell you, you know, it's a $20 bill or whatever the case may be. Um, it can mm -hmm. scan different colors and so forth as well. So, you know, we know that blind people don't necessarily know a color, but they feel the color. Thank you all so much. And Becky, I must uh, commend you for no matter all the obstacles that you had to undergo, you still never gave up. And I have to commend you as well uh, so much for making it against all the odds that were or might have been against you. And yeah, look, look at where you are today. I guess um, our education systems need to be challenged as well uh, to make more improvements and make a life for learners with a disability more um, you know, flexible and easier for them to access education. And well, uh, to Ronel and uh, Maria, I want to say thank you also for making time and for giving such knowledgeable uh, insights into what we might not um, have considered as able-bodied people in regard to learning with disability as well and the policies that need to be implemented, the technologies that need to be developed. Thank you all so much for making time for this edition. And to you, our viewers, we welcome your feedback on EdTech Monday at mastercardfdn.org or .org. Uh, you can send us your feedback. We'll be so glad to read it out and also share our insights with the respect Active, um, players in the education system or ecosystem. My name is Joy Doreen Bira. Thank you all for watching and until the next one, bye-bye for now. EdTech Mondays Africa is supported by the MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning in ICT and is part of the Foundation's Young Africa Works programming.